and we will go from current slide ultimately and I'll just remind you of these announcements coming up a week from Wednesday is the College Transfer Fair Day 2020 and this will be from 930 to 1130 on the Birmingham West Campus Academic Building B Hall and then the next day a week from this Thursday the 13th on this campus 930 to 1130 and uh, this building in fact the uh, building A and it'll also be uh, somewhere around the cafeteria. I think it'll probably be in the faculty staff dining room, but I don't know. They say the campus cafeteria, which I don't think is big enough and for time of day to be hosting that. All right, uh, and then I've told you several times about this uh, great REU, which is Research Experience for uh, Undergraduates, being held at the University of Illinois. Arkansas and Howard University, 10-week internship, uh, fantastic opportunity for anyone who's in the fields of mechanical, electrical, or material engineering. Uh, if you know other people who are in that field, let them know a fantastic opportunity. They pay you for that fantastic opportunity. $5,000 they pay you to participate. They give you free housing, which I think includes food and and round trip airfare to and from whichever campus you're going. I've got more information here if you're interested. The deadline on this says the 15th, on this says the 17th. 17th makes more sense. That's a Monday. 15th is a Saturday. So I'm guessing it's the 17th. So get them in early. Okay. So if anyone wants to see more of that, help yourself. All right. Any questions? Anything we've done so far? Okay. This morning, I was going to try to start working on your test, um, and something else came up I didn't get to, so I'm hoping to this afternoon start working, because this is a new text. Uh, I've got to make up some new tests for this tech test, and Cengage does some strange things, too. Uh, the last, that book, when I got the PowerPoints, it also loaded the test bank for me. This one, it didn't, so I've got to go back and see why it didn't load the test bank. So I'll be doing that this afternoon. That's why I couldn't get it done this morning. All right. Uh, so hopefully by Wednesday I'll give, have your test ready for you. Any questions? Anything we've done so far? All right. We uh, are on in Chapter 2, Limits and Their Properties, 2.4, Continuity and One-Sided Limits. And we were doing example six, which is also at LarsonCalculus.com. There you can see an interactive version of this type of example, but it's not on the slide set. So I've got to go back and find, well, no, here it is, right there. Okay, that's exactly where I need it. The next theorem, which we're going to have, which is a consequence of the an earlier theorem, 2.5, allows you to determine the continuity of composite functions such as uh, f of x is log of 3x. So you see you're taking the log of a polynomial. Pretty simple polynomial, but it is. That's a composite function. Or f of x being the square root of x squared plus 1. Well, x squared plus 1 is a polynomial. You're taking the square root of the polynomial, a composite function. And f of x equal one tangent of one over x, which is taking the tangent one function of a, another function, the reciprocal function. So here's the deal on this. This is theorem two twelve. If g or f, okay, is a is con, well, I'm sorry, no, sorry about that. G being the innermost function. If g is continuous at some value c. Okay, so let's go back and look here. Uh, what value C would that, the G function is the inner function, 3X. What value would that be continuous? 3X. Where is 3X continuous? All real numbers, okay? How about this one? Where is that continuous? The inner function here, X squared plus 1. All real numbers. How about this one? All real numbers. 
except zero. You cannot divide by zero. Okay? So these two would be all real numbers. This would be any negative number or any positive number, but not zero. Okay? And Devante? Houston. No. Huh? Houston. Houston. Houston, got it. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, if G is continuous at C, so C here could be any real number, C here could be any real number, C here could be any real number except zero. Okay. And F is continuous at G of C. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Does this limit what X could be? You said here 3X could be any real number, which is true. But can it be if we're taking log of x, a log of 3x? No, why not? Log cannot be 0 or negative. Exactly. So, whoops, even though this is good at any value, all real numbers, this is not good when it is. So f must be continuous at g of c. So c of 0 would work for the 3x, but it won't work for log of 3x. Uh, x of negative 1 or negative anything would, not, would work here, but it won't work there. Okay? So you see f must be continuous at uh, g of c. Now here, does anything change here? Taking the square root of x squared plus 1. No problem there at all. Why? What can you not take the square root of? Negatives. But x squared plus 1 is never negative. Okay? It can't even be 0. Because the smallest x squared can be is 0. Add 1 to it is 1. So all of those values are good. Okay? So G, so F is continuous at all G of C's, whatever C is. Okay? Now, of course, this X can't be zero, but for any X other than zero, any negative X, you can take the tangent of it, and any positive X, you can take the tangent of it. So no problem there. So, so first G has to be continuous at C, but then also F must be continuous at G of C. Okay? Then the composite function given by F composed with G of X, often read F of G of X, is continuous at C. Okay? So got two things to check. Make sure G is continuous. The innermost function is and then the outermost function is continuous to all values of g of c for g of c. Okay. So describe the intervals on which each of these functions is continuous. Where is tangent x continuous? Interval or intervals? Where is tangent x continuous? Say again. Okay. How about pi halves? Oops. Yeah. If all real numbers except your half pies. Okay. Uh, because for every half pi, cosine of any half pi is zero, and tangent is sine of the cosine. So you have to eliminate all those. So the interval over which each function is continuous. All values for x except the half pies. How about g of x? Okay. Describe the intervals on which each function is continuous. First, is there a problem here? The 
innermost function is 1 over x. Not with this included. All real numbers here are good, but there's a signing uh, x equals 0 to be 0, g of x, g of 0 to be 0. Does that fix our problem? That's the question. What you think? As x is approaching 0 from the left, okay, sine of x is just doing this faster and faster and faster and faster and faster because this is getting to be a very large negative number. And sine of a very large negative number just keeps going up and down, up and down, up and down. And you know, the, it doesn't ever vary. So no, assigning and approaching from the right, same deal. As x approaches 0 from the right, this one does this kind of motion. Just up and down, faster and faster and faster and faster, closer and closer together. Assigning that value 0 does nothing to help these two meet. They'll never meet. Okay, so describe the intervals on which each function is continuous, only on this interval. This does nothing to help us. Okay, so any x negative, less than zero, or any x positive, greater than zero. You can still do it. The sign just goes up and down and up and down. But, uh, and it's continuous there. It will never be continuous to zero. All right. Then how about this one? h of x is equal to x times the sine of 1 over x. And x is not 0, but it's 0 when x is 0. Does that help us any? Well, this requires a little more... Um, maybe of a imagination or insight, something like that. What happened? What is going on here? Anyone remember functions like that? I may have to talk with your treat instructors, okay? Because I know that was in that course. What do we call this? There are several names for it. Uh, these are functions that, one way to look at them, variable, um, what's the title for that? Uh, magnitude or amplitude, variable amplitude. The amplitude is always changing, okay? Um, don't know if you remember this, okay? Let's do a quick and dirty on this one, okay? Now, if you were do, doing the sine of 1 over x we've already talked about, sine of x, sine of whatever follows here just goes back and forth, up and down between plus and minus 1. But the closer it gets to 0, the faster and faster it goes. Yeah. Because this is getting to be an enormous number. Same thing on this side. You know, it coming in like this, and then goes faster, 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 faster. Okay. Now, what this is, normally if you had a number in front of a sine or a cosine function, it's called the amplitude. Okay? Well, this is a, to fit that in, this is the identity function. Okay, you remember that? Y is, e or H of X equal X. Okay, or you also do the, the negative in there. And this forms what we call, what I call an envelope. And then this function has to stay within that envelope. Now, that should have crossed at the origin. So this one would be coming in something like, because this, the envelope's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go out here, 
something like this, like this, like this, like this, and then it starts going closer and closer and closer, right? It goes crazy as it gets close to zero, but it has to stay inside the envelope here. And this is the same thing. It's doing like this here, and then just goes up and down, up and down, but has to get closer and closer to zero there. Does this fix that for us? Yes, it does. So this will be good, all real numbers. I wish I could remember what the trig book called this kind of function. I call it a variable amplitude function. They called it something else. Um, oh, I know the name, but I can't think of it. Um, but anyway, that's what happens there. That does get closer and closer. Not defined at x equals 0 here, but that's all right. It's not defined there. But when it is equal to 0, set it equals 0, it's got to come in and be there. Because that is approaching 0 there. All right, so let's see how this was uh, example seven. Let's see how they answer that question. The tangent function f of x equal tangent x is undefined at all of your half pi's. One half pi plus any n pi. Okay, not two half pi. Now that's not what I mean. Anything that's an Odd number of pi's over 2. Any of those, uh, that's the only place where it's defined. Uh, that's the place where it's undefined. So at all other points, f is continuous. So at all points for f, it's continuous to everything except where it's not defined. Okay? And those are your vertical asymptotes. Okay? So, oh, and here's the graph of it. So it's continuous on all these open intervals from negative 2n plus 1 pi over 2 to 2n pi over 2. Yeah, every, every interval that doesn't include a half pi. Okay? So these are not included, those not included, these not included. And here it is. Everywhere in between those intervals continues not on the interval. That's why they put open parentheses here. Vertical asymptotes is not included. Does that make sense? Every value other than those half pies. All right. Now, this one, this is the second one, that it continues everywhere except x equals zero. Sine function is continuous for, is continuous for all real values of x. It follows that sine of 1 over x is continuous at all real values except x equals 0. Um, and here's Devante, right? Okay. Uh, at x equals 0, the limit of g of x does not exist, and you can't make it exist. Even assigning a value will not make it exist because this keeps getting more rapid, up and down, up and down, up and down, never is approaching zero. This one's from the right is doing the same thing. It just keeps going up and down. The closer you get to zero, either way. Okay, so the assigning a value here does nothing to make the limit exist. Now, the C one, similar to the B, except that the oscillation's damped. That's what it is. Damp periodic functions. All right. Uh, be sure you put the B in there. Never mind. Okay. But anyway, using the squeeze theorem, which of course we wanted to use, um, the this function, of course, is not equal to zero, but it has to be between this because the sine of one over x is between plus and minus one. So at its minimum, it's going to be minus 1. Maximum is going to be plus 1. So this function here is always going to be in between those values. But since the uh, this expression is that identity function and it's negative, you can conclude 
that the limit as x approaches zero of h of x is zero, especially since you defined it that way, that the h of x was zero, zero. Okay, so it's got to be coming in because of this is their drawing, uh, and they know a lot more about what it's doing. It really stretches out, out here, but in here it goes crazy, but it has to stay between the, what I call the envelope function, uh, plus minus, plus the square root of x and minus the square root of x. I mean, minus. plus x and minus x. Okay? And it has to stay between those. And the closer it gets, even though this function will still not be defined at x equals 0, this making it 0, yeah, it's going to come in and zoom in towards 0. No choice. Does that make sense? Now, when do you really run into functions like this? In calculus textbooks. And that's about all that I can ever imagine. But it is there. Um, actually, my younger brother worked for an electric power company, a small one, you know, rural electric uh, co-op. They used to be called, but they're power companies now. And there was something about adjusting the sine wave of a of the signals to take out some of the static. It wasn't this function, but sometimes these kind of things you do run into in real life. So I don't want to want to belittle that. I can't think of that uh, example for that specifically, but there are times when it does. Okay? Some of these really weird looking functions. But this one I can't think of any appropriate application of that. All right, but too much for that. Let's move on to intermediate value theorem. This theorem, 213, is an important theorem concerning the behavior of functions that are continuous on a closed interval. Okay? Continuous on a closed interval. If f is continuous on this closed interval, a to b, okay, means a it has a value, B, it has a value, and it's continuous with everything in between, as long as f of a is not equal to f of b. And k is any number between f of a and f of b. Whatever f of a is and f of b, they can't be the same, but as long as they're any different value, k is some number between f of a and f of b, then there is at least one number c, on that interval a to b, such that alpha c is equal to k. Blah, 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 right? Okay. Now, what does that mean? Okay? Just imagine your function. Whatever it's doing, whatever it is, here's a to b. Okay? And f of a could be somewhere up here and f of b somewhere down there. What it's saying is there's some value k in between f of a and f of b, it's on the y-axis, the y-axis. And for, for any value k in between these, if that's a continuous function on that closed interval, then there's got to be at least some value c in here where the f of c is equal to that k. Okay? Let's see if we can get a picture rather than my waving arms. Well, not yet. Okay. The intermediate value theorem tells you that at least one number C exists. There may be a dozen, 300, or something like that, but it does not provide a method for finding that value C. Such theorems like this are called existence theorems. A proof of this theorem is based on the property of real numbers called completeness, which I know y'all are interested in, and the intermediate value theorem states that for a continuous function L, if X on take x takes on all the values between a and b, which is a continuous function it must, then f of x must take on all the values between f of a and f of b. Okay? Got to. As long as a is not equal to b. Okay? If it was, it doesn't say a lot. Okay, as an example of the application of intermediate value theorem, consider a person's height. Let's say a girl is 5 feet tall on her 13th birthday, 
and five feet two inches tall on her 14th birthday. Okay? There had to be at least one day in that year in between that she was 5'1", right? She just doesn't skip over. Her height is a continuous function. So for any value in between 5'2", five, 5 feet and 5'2", five, 5 feet and a half inch, 5 feet and 3 quarters inch, 5 feet 1 and 3 quarters inch, whatever, there has to be at least one day when she was that high. Intermediate value pair. Anything in between the max and the min, those are obviously not the same, then there is, a, well, not even max or min, between the endpoint, F value and endpoint, it's going to be at least one day, uh, one value in between, for every value in between that. Then for any height, H between 5 feet and 5 feet 2, there must be have been some time T in that time period when her height was exactly that value. Okay. H. Okay. This seems reasonable because human growth is continuous and a person's height does not abruptly change from one value to another. Some people almost seems that way. My older brother and I were talking last week about a classmate of his he was one of the shortest guys in his class when he graduated from high school. When he came home after his freshman year at college, he was almost the tallest guy in his class. He had just six inches in one year. Okay, it was just amazing. Okay, but at any time in between that, he was one, one, only one height. And he didn't skip any heights. The intermediate value theorem guarantees the existence of at least one number C on a closure. Here's the Here's the graph I was looking for, okay? There may, of course, be more than one number C, such that F of C is K, as shown here. If this is your function, there's a function, continuous function, between F of A and F of B. I mean, A and B, between A and B, closed interval. Okay, it has a value of F of A, it has a value of B, which would be F of B. Okay, here are those values. For any number K in between, f of a and f of b, any number k, there's going to be at least one value because this is a continuous function. You can't get around it. There's some at least one value c where, on the x-axis, where f of c is going to be equal to that k. Here, there's actually three of them. It crosses here, here, and there. Fine, no problem. If the k was up here, it would only have one value. Or down down here, there would only be one value. But anywhere in here, here there would be two values, here there would be two values. In between here and here there would be three values. Yeah. So, but there's going to be at least one value in between, where K being between F of A and F of B, there's going to be at least one C in that interval A to B where it crosses. Okay? There can be more than one. A function that is not continuous does not necessarily exhibit the intermediate value property. Of course it would. If it's not a continuous function, there could be gaps there. And if there's a gap and the k's in that gap, then there is no c value for which this function is equal to k. So don't even expect it there. For example, the graph of the function shown here jumps over the horizontal line y is equal to k. And for this function, there's no real value c on A to B, such that alpha C is equal to K. So for piecewise defined functions that have uh, you know, gaps or, or skip values, that the intermediate value doesn't hold, only for continuous functions. The intermediate value theorem often can be used to locate zeros of a function that is continuous on a closed interval. Specifically, if F is continuous on A to B, and f of a and f of b differ in sign. f of a is positive, f of b is negative, or f of b a is negative, f of b positive. Somewhere in between there, it's going to have to cross the x-axis. If it's a continuous function, it's got to cross the x-axis at least once, maybe more than once. Guarantees the existence of at least one zero uh, in that closed interval. Does that help you find it? No, it just tells you it exists. And then you use other techniques to find that zero. Here's example eight. I don't know.
guess there's any reason to sit down. I guess everything's there. Use the intermediate value theorem to show that the polynomial function f of x is equal to x cubed minus two, uh, plus 2x minus 1 has a 0 on the interval from 0 to 1. What's it going to take to, for you to uh, determine it has a 0 between 0 and 1? Okay, yeah, let's figure those. But before you do that, what do you have to know about this? For the intermediate value theorem to work, that must be a continuous function. If it's not continuous, you can't guarantee this. Well, is that a continuous function? Yay or nay? Yes, because it's a polynomial function. All polynomial functions are always continuous. Rational functions, not necessarily. Sines and cosines, cosines, yes. The other four trig function, not necessarily. In fact, no. Okay. Um, so, this is a polynomial function, therefore it is continuous. So, we first have to determine what f of 0 is and what f of 1 is. So, let's do that first. That's what I understood JJ to say we should do. So, let's first do f of 0. Oh, that's hard to do, isn't it? What's that? Say again? Negative 1. Okay, one of my favorite evaluations at zero. Okay, so let's do f of one. What does that turn out being? Did I hear an answer? Two. Okay, one is another one of my favorite ones to evaluate. Okay, can you guarantee this is going to have a zero between zero and one? Yes, you can, because these differ in signs, continuous function, so somewhere between x equals 0 and x equals 1, we'll call it 0, it's down here at minus 1, at 1, it's up here at plus 2, somewhere in between there, it's got to cross the x-axis, because it's a continuous function. It may actually cross it once, twice, or three times. Can't be any more than three, but uh, in this function. But uh, it's going to cross at least once. Okay? Note the f is continuous on the closed interval 0 to 1. In fact, it's continuous everywhere as a polynomial function. Okay? And because f of 0 is negative 1 and f of 1 is 2, it follows that um, f of 0 is less than 0, and f of 1 is greater than 0? Yes, okay. You can therefore apply the intermediate value theorem to conclude there must be some c on 0 to 1 such that f of c is 0, and here they have identified not what the value is, but it does exist. f of 0 is minus 1, f of 1 is 2. Somewhere in between there, it's got to cross at least 1. They've actually drawn it and shown it's one and exactly one. Okay. Because this is a cubic function, it could have gone up and down, but it had to go back up. So it could have had two or three crosses. But it this moment had one. Okay. Again, it didn't help you find the value. Now, anyone want to suggest how we could find that value? Say again? Okay. How could you go about finding the value for C? <coughs> and I'll tell you this. The odds of finding an exact value, two odds, swim and none. Okay? Probably not going to happen. But you can find approximately the value. Okay? One method they suggest, maybe on the next slide, is called the bisection. By Yeah, bisection method, that sounds like a weird word, okay? Since you know there's a zero in between there, let's just put 
0.5. Let's guess 0.5. So plug in 0.5 here. 0.5 cubed would be 0.125 plus twice 0.5 would be 1. Minus 1, that would be 0.125. Positive. Okay, so it's positive there. Okay, well then if it's positive here and negative here, just forget about 1. Let's do halfway between those two. 0.25. Plug those in, and I bet you it's going to turn out negative. So then take the halfway between 0.25 and 0.5. Okay? Bisection. You bisect each. When you have a positive and a negative, take the middle in between. Take the middle in between and keep going. Uh, this method is called this, but I like to think of it the same way that Archimedes talked about finding the area of a circle using uh, polyhedrons, you know, things that he could find the area of. He do uh, regular polyhedrons outside of the circle, inside of the circle, and kept getting more and more sides to them until he came really close to having the same value and say, okay, it's something in between this and this. He called that the method of exhaustion. Because it was really difficult just calculating all those many sided figures. But you could do it. Well, do the same thing here until you get so tired of doing it. Say, okay, that's within three decimal places. I'm happy. We'll stop there. Okay. A lot more practical for most of you people who now have computers and possibly graphing calculators. Let your graphing calculator do it. Now, later we'll come up with a technique or we'll demonstrate a technique called Newton's method. Oh my goodness, that guy Newton, he was amazing. If you have a graphing calculator or a computer, the odds are that's using Newton's method. Uh, not only did he invent calculus, but he invented applications of calculus and no one's improved on it yet. Okay? <laughs> Incredible mind. Okay? But we won't go there yet. Okay? But most graphing calculators are what they call graphing utilities. Have a way to do similar, not the bisection method, that's awfully slow, but we'll later find using Newton's method, which we haven't gotten to yet because we don't have the skills to do that yet, gets there really quickly. Okay. Any questions on this? Oh, here we go. The bisection method uh, for approximating the real zeros. Uh, of a continuous function similar to the method used in example 8. Uh, okay, I see what they're saying there. We just did example 8. If you know that a zero exists on a closed interval A to B, then the zero must lie somewhere on the interval, either between A and halfway between A and B, or between halfway between A and B and B. One of those two, you know, uh, unless it happened to fall right on that, but then it would be on both of them, okay? Uh, then, from the sign of f of halfway between a and b, if it's a, remember, had a sign of negative, if this sign was positive, then it's going to be between those two. If this was positive, it's not going to be between those two because both of them are positive. So then you take those two and do bisect it again and bisect it again, every time going with the ones with opposite signs. So from the sign of alpha, a plus of the midpoint, you can determine which interval contains a zero. That one did. So, no. This one did. Okay. Uh, no, that one did. That was the one that did. Okay. By repeatedly bisecting the interval, you can close in on the zero of the function it may take a while, but you can do it. Okay. And that's the last slide in the section. Any questions? 2.4. Homework exercises here includes any of the odds, 5 through 9. They're all at count chat. 5's at count view. Any of the odds, 11 through 31. A whole bunch of those. They're all at count chat, 11's at count view. Any of either 33 or 35, both at count chat, 33's at count view. Either 37 or 39, they're both at count chat, 37's at count view. 
any of the odds 41 to 59, they're all at Calc Chat. Uh, 47 is at Calc View. Any of the odds 61 to 65, they're all at Calc Chat. 61 is at Calc View. 67 or 69, both at Calc Chat. 67 is at Calc View. Either 71 or 73, both at Calc Chat. Any of the odds 75 to 81, all at Calc Chat. 83 to 87, all at Calc Chat. 89 should be at Calc Chat. Any of the odds 91 to 97 should be at Calc Chat. 99 to 103 should be at Calc Chat. 99 is at Calc View. You can explore doing 105 or 107. They both should be at Calc Chat. If they're not, don't worry with them. Um, 109 to 113 are all true false. Um, you can check those at Calc Chat. 115, you can think about doing that one if you choose. And 117, same thing. Whoa, there's more! 117. Goodness gracious. Through 131. Choose any of those that you're interested in, in doing. All right. Looking at those, now this is not one that I would have assigned because it's even. The Dereclet formula, which is one I think we mentioned in the text, just reminding you, you could write on who in the world Dereclet was, or Dereclet if, if, if it's French, uh, maybe mispronounced even then. Um, or you can write on how he developed this function, or maybe more interesting, why he developed this function. I can't think of any practical application of it. Maybe he was just a theoretical mathematician. Uh, but anyway, there's a potential paper topics there. Remember, the book can be a source of ideas. It can't be the source for your papers, but it can be the source of ideas. There's also a signum function. You can write on what in the world that is or what's it used for. Uh, so there are other things you can do with some of those homework exercises. Any questions? 2.4. All right. Then let's move on to 2.5. Last section in Chapter 2. That's why I said I'll try to have your test ready on Wednesday. And there is a part of me that doesn't even like this section at all. Okay, still Chapter 2, Limits and Their Properties. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron to you? Infinite limits. Okay, wait a minute. If it's infinite, it doesn't have a limit. That's the definition of infinity. There is no limit. So infinite limits. What? Okay. But there are some sort of a little bit of practical applications to considering these. So we're going to go through these hopefully pretty easily or quickly or something uh, because to me this is... If it's infinite, it doesn't have a limit. What are you talking about? So we'll determine the infinite limits, which I don't see how we will, from left and from the right. Okay. We'll find and sketch vertical asymptotes of the graph of the function. Now that is making sense. We've done that before. Okay. So that's basically what we're dealing with here. So let's consider a function. f of x is equal to 3 over x minus 2. Now, when you look at a function like this, what comes to mind? What can x not equal? Two, okay, because you can't divide by zero, okay? So, obviously, x can't equal two. And as x approaches two, either from the left or from the right, if it approaches two from the left, this number is more negative than two, so therefore, this is going to be a negative, uh, yeah, a negative number. So it's going to be a negative something more negative than 2, subtract 2. So that's going to be heading downhill fast, okay? If it's approaching from the right, it's going to be something less negative than 2. Well, then when you subtract 2 from something less negative than 2, uh, it's going to be becoming positive. 
Okay? So therefore, <laughs> near the twain to me. Okay, they're not even gonna get close. Uh, here's your table if you like doing it in tables. You see this is heading uh, when you plug in a 1.999 from the left, you get something close to negative 3,000, okay? And breaks from the right, 2.001, you get positive 3,000. Don't think there's going to be a limit there, do you? Okay? Closer you get the two, the further they get apart. And this is how your graph goes, okay? And right now, I mean, as soon as you see this, x cannot equal 2. Draw your vertical asymptotes in there. That's not a removable discontinuity. Okay? So, draw it in. Okay? You see the x decreases without bound as you approach 2 from the left. Increases without bound as you approach 2 from the right. It doesn't have a limit at x equal 2. So, they say it has an infinite limit, which is a limit. It's a, yeah, I don't know. All right. This behavior is denoted this way. The limit as x approaches 2 from the lower side of 3 over x minus 2 is going to negative infinity. So x is decreasing without bound as x approaches 2 from the left, but it's increasing without bound as x approaches 2 from the right. Okay? So why do they say limits at infinity? It doesn't have a limit. Okay, the symbol. Infinity and negative infinity refer to positive infinity and negative infinity respectively, as respectively, okay? So they don't exist, okay? Those symbols do not represent real numbers. They are convenient symbols used to describe unbounded conditions more concisely. So why talk about a limit if it doesn't exist and it doesn't? Those go to increase or decrease without bound. So a limit in which f increases or decreases without bound as x approaches c is called an infinite limit, which is a good way to phrase it in my mind. Okay. So here's the definitions. And you see there are some multiple situations here. Let f be a function that is defined at every real number on some open interval containing c, except possibly at c itself, then the statement that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to infinity suggests there is no limit to it. So why do you say it has a limit at infinity? Uh, that means for each value m greater than zero, okay, now they don't tell you what this m is to begin with, um, but this is, remember, our limit, formal definition of limit, we start for each epsilon greater than zero. Well, this is an m greater than zero. The epsilon before was a y value, m is a y value. Okay? For each m greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. And delta, remember, is an x value. Okay? Such that uh, if f of x is greater than m whenever zero is between x and c, Okay, and delta, x minus c and delta, okay? Uh, similarly, the statement, this is. So it says that f of x, if you get inside of that delta, no matter how big the m you choose, you can find you a delta somewhere up there that the f of x is always going to be greater than m. So that means f of x is greater than m. Don't they have this backwards? This should be going to positive infinity. If f of x here is greater than m when x is inside delta, that should be a positive infinity there. Oh, no, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. That, this is relating to this one. Similarly, the statement this means there's an n less than zero. I'm sorry. I was reading this together. These two go together. These two go together. Uh, then there's some n less than zero such that for any delta greater than zero, 
your f of x is always going to be less than your that capital N whenever you get inside that delta. The difference between x and c is inside that. To define the infinite limit from left, replace this by c minus delta less than c. Okay? So this is if it's approaching from the left. See, this is approaching going to positive infinity both from the left and the right. If you're only going to do one side, it then just do the minus side of that delta. Uh, and from the right, do the plus side of that delta. And again, it's talking about an infinite limit, which is an oxymoron. Okay. So here's example one. Determine the limit of each function shown uh, figure 2.4 as x approaches 1 from the left or the right. Okay. Obviously, what's the limit is x approaches 1 from the left here. It doesn't exist. Okay, that would be the correct answer. They would say positive infinity. How about from the left? I mean, from the right? Positive infinity. In reality, it doesn't exist. This one, though, where f of x equals, and, and I mean, what gives this away? This numerator is always positive. That denominator is always positive. So positive divided by positive is going to be positive. So left or right is going to be positive. However, this one, um, as x approaches 1 from the left-hand side, from less than 1, then the denominator is negative, the numerator is negative, so this is positive. But as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side, x minus 1, x is greater than minus 1, or greater than 1, sorry, greater than 1, so that's going to be positive. This is negative, so this is going to negative. So again, I were asked, determine the limit doesn't exist. Okay, that's what I would say. They want you to say positive infinity here, negative infinity there. Why, I'm not sure. Okay, so the first of those cases, uh, when x approaches 1 from either right or left, um, x minus 1 will be either negative or positive. If it's approaching from the left, it's going to be negative. If it's approaching from the right, it's going to be positive. But guess what? When you square either of those, it's going to be positive. So therefore, it will be a small positive number. The closer you get to 1, the smaller it's going to be, but you're dividing that 1 divided by that is going to explode large. Uh, so the quotient 1 over an incredibly small positive number is going to be an incredibly large positive number. So you approach this either from the right or left. Limit from each side is. Doesn't exist, okay? But it's going positive in both directions. Okay? And that confirms that analysis. When x approaches 1 from the left, this is the b part. The 1 minus x is a small negative number. x minus 1 is a small negative number. But the quotient then would be a, a large positive number. And the closer you get to 1, of course, the larger it gets, but stays positive. So that concludes that x approaches 1 from the left-hand side. You're going to a positive infinity, or from the right-hand side, it'll go to a negative infinity. They don't exist, okay? So why don't you just say that and be done with it, okay? Now, they tell you there's a technology uh, blurb at the bottom of page 108. If you're using uh, graphing utility or whatever, be very careful if you happen to hit that thing, it's going to give you an error, but look on either side of it and see what it's going to. You can't just plug in the value. Or you can, but it gives you an error. You have to look on either side to see which way it's heading. 
So let's now look at vertical asymptotes, which is what we've been looking at. I don't know why they didn't do this part first. If it were be possible or possible to extend the graph uh, of figure 422, I'm sorry, 2.40, okay, toward positive and negative infinity, you would see that each graph becomes arbitrarily close to the vertical line x equal 1, okay? That line is called the vertical asymptote, okay? Same thing here. This is getting infinitely close to it. This is going infinitely close to it. Here, left side is going infinitely close to it. There. Okay? Never touches. Never touches. They get closer and closer and closer, okay? Those are called vertical asymptotes. Now, Math books are doing this far more now. What I like to do is look at that and say, this denominator cannot be zero, okay? Well, what does that mean? That means x minus one cannot be zero. So x cannot equal one. Same thing here. x minus one cannot equal zero, therefore x cannot equal one. You just solve that inequality. It cannot equal two and do it. And that gives you the vertical asymptote, but then I put the slash to it. X cannot equal negative one. That's where it's the dotted line in the, the graph of the function can never cross it or touch it because it can't happen. Okay, that's my way of doing it. The books always do this. That's the vertical asymptote where X would equal one. I'd rather say X can't equal one, therefore it's a vertical asymptote. So here's the definition of vertical asymptote. If x, f of x approaches infinity or negative infinity as x approaches c from the right or from the left, then the line uh, x equals c uh, is a vertical asymptote. Okay? In example one, note that each of the functions is a quotient that has and that the vertical asymptote occurs at the number at which the denominator is zero. And the numerator is not zero. Okay, that's the key. Remember, if both of them are zero, that's indeterminate. You may have a vertical asymptote there, but you can't guarantee it. But if that numerator is not zero, the denominator is, you guarantee that's going to be a vertical asymptote there. Next theorem generalizes this observation. 2.14. F and G be continuous functions on an open interval containing the value C. Now, if F of C is not equal to zero, but G of C is equal to zero, then there exists an open interval containing C such that G of X is not equal to zero for all X is not equal to C, okay, in that interval then the graph of this function, h of x, equals f of x, which is not equal to zero, over g of x, which can be zero, x is equal to zero, x equal to c, uh, that has a vertical asymptote for it, x equal to c. Now, if f of x were zero there too, then the odds are, no guarantee, that you might be able to factor this, factor this, and divide out common factors that eliminates that uh, vertical asymptote there. Leaves you a hole in the graph there, but it eliminates the vertical asymptote. We did that earlier in the, what did they call it, division method or, or something of eliminating. There. So, here's example two, bottom of page 109. This is both on the PowerPoint and available at LarsonCalculus.com for an interactive version of that type of example. So when x is equal to negative 1, the denominator h of x is equal to 1 over 2 times x plus 1. That denominator is 0, but the numerator is 1, which is not 0. What does that tell you? What would x equal negative 1 be? Vertical asymptote. Okay. I don't know what. Okay. And here's the graph to show it. 
So by theorem 214, which indicated if your numerator is not zero and your denominator can be zero at some value, then at that place you have the vertical asymptote. I like to think of this as x cannot equal minus one. So therefore I put the dotted line in there, the function can't touch it or cross it. Okay? As a vertical asymptote. Okay. Now, how about this one? Um, yeah, okay. I don't know why they tell you what to do. They sort of just given you h of x equals x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1. Okay, forget that. Then ask you what to do to determine what values have and have, you know, do and don't have mean. But the thing to notice there, the numerator is always positive. Always positive. Never zero never negative. The denominator on the hand could either be positive or negative. It's positive any time x is less than 1 or greater than 1 because you're squaring. And if you square a number less than 1, like negative 2 or 0 or whatever, anything less than, let's see, did I say that right? If I'm guaranteeing that to be zero, then x has to be between plus or minus one. Because anything outside of that is going to give you, when you square it, that number becomes greater than one. And anything on the right side of one, when you square it, it becomes greater than one. So anything out there is going to be positive in the denominator. So we have a positive numerator, a positive denominator. Anything inside plus or minus one, then x squared, like 0, or 0.5, or point, negative 0.2, or whatever, when you square it, it's still a small number less than 1. So that's going to be negative. Okay? Now, at plus or minus 1, because when you do factor this, you see x can't be 1, x can't be negative 1. So therefore, vertical asymptotes, no way around it. Okay? Those vertical asymptotes, it's negative in between those, positive on the outside of those. So this is what the function looks like. Now, hopefully you remember doing functions like that back in pre-calculus algebra when you did rational functions, because that indeed is a rational function. What were some other things you could determine about a rational function? Vertical asymptotes are when your denominators were zero. X equals plus one, x equals minus one. They can't be factored out. Vertical asymptotes there. What else can you determine from this? One thing is h of x is never zero. Because for h of x to be 0, that means the numerator has to be 0. Because any time you have a fractional form to be 0, the numerator's got to be 0. And this one can't be 0. Remember we said that. This is always non-negative. Add 1 to it, it's always positive. Okay? So that will never be 0. So this doesn't have, if the y cannot be 0, that means there is no horizontal intercept, x-intercept. It is none and it never crosses the x-axis. Now, when x is 0, that's okay. Because when x equals 0, that becomes plus 1, that becomes minus 1. Plus 1 over minus 1 is minus 1. Yes, it has a y-intercept at minus 1. Okay? No x-intercepts, one y-intercept. You can't ever have more than one y-intercept. Wouldn't be a function of this. Here's the other thing you can determine. Horizontal asymptote. Look at the ratio of your leading terms. What's the ratio of x squared over x squared? 1. Horizontal asymptote at x, at y equal 1. Okay, because this is y. Okay. Alright, good deal.
there we weren't talking about those. That just other things that have to draft the function properly. Now, something about uh, horizontal lines. The function can cross it uh, anytime it wants to. It just in the long run, that's where the function's headed. That's what a horizontal asymptote is. Not that it can't cross or touch it. It could, but it doesn't have to. It, in the long run, it's approaching it. All right. Here is 2C. All right. Why did they write it for you? Okay. Um, why did they do all this? Why, they just should have stopped right here. What about this function? Where is this? Does this have any vertical asymptotes? Does it have any limits? Well, to answer the question, you rewrite this as cosine or cotangent x is cosine over sine. Well, now the question is sine ever zero? Yes, where? At your whole pi. 0, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi. So everywhere you have that, you have a vertical asymptote. Because the cosine is not 0 at those values. In fact, the cosine is either plus or minus 1 at those values. Okay? So therefore, you have the situation where your denominator is 0 and your numerator is not, and those are at your whole pi's. Okay? So that makes those your vertical asymptotes. Okay, and because both of these are positive in the first quadrant, uh, your your cotangent function is positive in the first quadrant because they're in the second quadrant. Sine is positive, cosine is negative. That makes the quotient negative there. Third quadrant. They're both negative, so that makes this positive again. Fourth quadrant. Cosine is positive, sine is negative, so the opposite sign is going back the other way the same way. So this is what cotangent looks like. Okay. Any questions on that? I don't, can't think of what else to say about it. So the graph of this function has infinitely many vertical asymptotes. They occur at all your whole pi's. N is any integer, n pi. All right, I guess that leads, oh, no, it doesn't. It leads to examples three and four, which we don't have. Ooh, not much writing room there, is there? Or there. But there we've got some. So let's do. Example three here. Determine all the vertical asymptotes of the graph of h of x is equal to x squared plus 2x minus 8 divided by x squared minus 4. Now, what would be your approach to a problem such as that? Anybody? Factor everything in sight, okay? In that numerator, is it factorable? We don't know that for sure, but we will sure give it a shot. It's the only possible factorization for x squared. Anybody? x times x, right? Only way you can factor x squared, okay? Then let's, let's look next at the sine of the last term. I call this unfoiling it, okay? You go to, from first to last. We don't spell it right, but whatever. What's the sine of that last term? Negative. What does that tell you about these two signs? They've got to be different. So one's plus, one's minus. We don't care which is which. Now, since they're different signs, we're looking for two numbers that multiply to be 8, but whose difference is 2, because they're different signs. 
Two numbers is multiplied to be eight, but the difference is two. Four and two. Which is which? Which follows the plus, which follows the minus? You can guess if you want to. It's fine. Second, four to be positive and two to be the negative. I think you guessed right unless you reasoned it. Let's see if that's true. X times X is X squared. That's okay. Outer uh, yeah, is minus 2X plus 4X. Sure enough is plus 2X minus 8. Good guess. Uh, okay. Next, the denominator. Does that factor? How? Say again. Okay, and what would that give you? X plus 2 and X minus 2. All right. Now we look at that, even though this tells you X cannot equal negative 2. And this tells you X cannot equal 2. However, these two can be factored out. You still can't have a 2 in there because this is your original problem. That would give you a 0 in the denominator. But then you'd have a 0 in the numerator as well. So that's a removable discontinuity. You don't have a um, vertical asymptote there. You do have one here. Okay? So this means you have a vertical asymptote at x equal not equal negative 2. I like to do my vertical asymptotes in red. That says, warning, 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 don't even get close. Oh, well, you can get close, but don't ever cross it. Okay? However, at x equal plus 2, we have a warning shot there, too. So I'm going to do a few more and a few more here, whatever, okay? And uh, I'm going to put kind of a little red mark here to say beware x can't equal 2. Maybe I should have put an open circle there, though it's in the wrong place, but uh, just to get the idea, x can't equal positive 2 either, but it's not going to be a vertical asymptote. All right. Now, other things you can get from what we just said. Where are your zeros of the function? Whoops. Where can a function be zero? Only where the numerator is zero. Where is the numerator zero? We can't have it there, so forget about that one. Okay? How about here? Negative four. So you have a zero at negative four. Okay? Right there is a zero. Whoops, I did that wrong. That's down here. That's your y value right here. Whoops. There is your boy not doing well today. Okay? So when x equals 0, y is equal to negative 4, right down there. Okay? Now, another thing you can do is, what's your, does this have a horizontal asymptote? Where do we look for that? Ratio of the leading terms. And what does that give you? Say again. 1. Okay? So y is equal to 1. Now, just because I'm doing asymptotes, uh, I'm going to do it in red, even though you can touch it or cross it. Uh, so, all right. Now, I, what I wished I had not drawn that. I drew that incorrectly before. Okay. get my pen back. Okay. Now, I can guarantee you this. This function, whoops, I'm in the wrong color. This point here is on the graph, so therefore it's going downhill here and 
approaching here. So that's what the function is doing there. Okay. What it's doing on the other side is up here. You'd have to do a test point there to see, but that's what it's going to wind up being. Okay. Is M, you know, it's positive over here, negative here. The reason is nothing. Uh, you don't have quantity squared. You just have individual squares. Oh, with one exception. A hole in the graph right there. Whatever that value is, and let's see what it is. At x equal 2, let's do this. That would be 2 plus 4 is 6, and 2 plus 2 is 4. That would be 3 halves. So the, that should be down here. So my graph is not very accurate. It should be that should be the hole in the graph. Okay, so let me get this one out of there. And I get that out of there. It's something like that. Okay? At three halves, you have that value. You can't... Whoa! I've turned this upside down, haven't I? Let me start some of this over here. Yuck! Okay. I can't get this to go away. Okay. There we go. All right. All right, let's do that again. Vertical asymptotes, that's all they asked for. We got that. I showed you what the horizontal asymptote is. Okay. Now, what we have to do here, and what I just did it, at three halves, not negative three halves, there is your positive value. X equal to three halves is right here. Okay? There is a place it can't be. Now, obviously, I did something wrong down here. So let's get that out of the picture here and see if we can figure out what I did wrong there. Uh, when X equal... negative 4, okay, when x equal negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, there's your horizontal asymptote. What was I thinking? That makes your numerator 0. That guarantees you're going this way here and this way here, okay? And we just determined that your vertical hole in the graph is at 3 halves, so that means from here you're going this way and that way. Okay, getting closer and closer. Yeah, there it is. There's the hole in the graph at negative two, three halves, and there was your vertical ascent. I mean, horizontal ascent. Hor X intercept at negative four. No y intercept. Well, I mean, you're, there is a. Oh, we didn't do that, did we? We should have done that. Y intercept here would be when x equals zero. When x equals 0, your y-intercept would be 0, 2. So this should be right here. There was another point we could have used. So there you have it. Yeah. All right. I don't know why that went off. But maybe it said I've made so many mistakes it should go off. Okay. So there we have it x equal to not a vertical asymptote hole in the graph okay but the uh, other is how are we doing on time 10 minutes oh excellent i think we have time to do example four second 15 minutes good okay any questions on that one after i botch it up about three or four times okay Let's go to example four. Find each limit here. There's two of them. Oh, twice the chances to botch it up. The limit as x approaches one from the negative side of x squared minus three x over x minus 1. 
and the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive side of the same thing. x squared minus 3x over x minus 1. Okay. Alright. I hope it's pretty obvious x cannot equal 1. Okay. So question from the left. Oh, wait. Before we did that, we ought to check and see if we could remove that. Uh, so, what can we do with that numerator? Anything? Okay, yeah, but first, factor it. x times x minus 3 over x minus 1. Same thing here, x times x minus 3. Nope, that doesn't help us at all. x can still not equal one. Okay? The numerator does not have a removable, you know, discontinuity, you know, anything that would help us there. Okay? So, I think all it's asking for, find the limit. They don't, I'll tell you, they don't exist, okay? But, they're saying, how do they not exist, I guess? What is happening here? as x approaches 1 from the negative side. What's happening down here? Let's take something left of uh, 1. Something left of 1. Pick a number left of, left of 1. An easy one. 0. That would be 0 over a minus 1. That's going to be negative, right? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. It would be zero. The value would be zero because numerator is zero. And x equals three. It's also zero. Okay. Well, that gives us two points that we could have on. We got two x-intercepts there. Okay. That doesn't really tell us too much about what's happening at x equals 1. Um, so I would say get something other than 0, because 0 and 3 happen to be zeros for the function. Okay? Let's get something closer to 1, like 1 half. Okay, when x equals 1 half, this is negative. When x equals 1 half, this would be 1 half, this would be negative two and a half, right? Yeah. Okay. So the product for those two is going to be negative. Um, Instead of half, like the negative three, it's going to be the numerator. Uh, one half minus three is negative two and a half, and that's going to be one half. That product's going to be negative. This, if we're to the left. That's going to be negative, okay? One half minus one is negative one half. So negative over negative is positive. So this must be going to positive infinity there. And let's see about here. Let's take something to the right of that, but not three. We can use two on this one. That will work fine. That numerator would be two times a negative one. So that's going to be negative. This is going to be positive, so that's going to negative. Okay. So I think we can conclude from that that x equal 1, there's our vertical asymptote. Okay. I like to do those in red. Okay. And it said. Um, find the limit of these two. Um, all right. Now here's a couple of other things you can do, whether you want to or not, okay? Uh, we already determined at x equals 0, we have a 0 for the function. And, yuck. 
Did I ever hit the wrong key? Okay. This is what I meant to do. Get rid of that one. Okay. Okay. X equals zero, you have a zero there, and X equals three, you have a zero there. Okay. And on this one, you don't have a horizontal asymptote because the ratio of X squared to X is X, and that's going positive. However, you do have what they call a slant asymptote, which we're not going to mess with now. You could do it if you wanted to, uh, but it's a... Well, let's just do it quickly. If you divided uh, this, which is, I'm going to do it by synthetic division, 1 minus 3, 0. Divide that by a 1, okay? Skip a line, draw a line, bring down this. That would be a 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, okay? So this would be x minus 2. Well, that would be a line that crosses the axis here and has a slope of 1. And I should be drawing that red. There is your slant asymptote. Okay? Now, I may not have drawn it quite right, but generally close. I think it goes through that point there. So this point here basically tells us, if I could get my pen to write, that you're approaching this going this way and this going that way. Now, I may not have the hump in the right place, but you got it. This is not looking right. I drew my asymptote in the wrong place. Minus 2 was... Goodness, today has been terrible, hasn't it? Okay. Uh, okay. Minus 2 is your y-intercept. Okay, not plus 2. Y minus 2 is the y-intercept. Duh! So, this is your y-intercept. But it still has a slope of 1, so your slant asymptote is this one. Something like that. Now, the fact, now we got it right, the fact that this is a point here, says you're approaching the vertical asymptote there and the slant asymptote in that direction. This one says you're approaching the slant asymptote. But you don't cross it, okay, and down there. So there's your graph using the slant asymptote. Now, the slant asymptote only works when your numerator is one degree more than the denominator. Because when you do the synthetic division, this has to be an x. If that was an x squared or x cubed or anything else, that doesn't work. But it's only if the degree of the numerator is one more than the degree of the denominator. And there's your, that function. They didn't ask for that. They just said, what is this doing? As x approaches 1 from the ne negative side, that's going to positive infinity. As it approaches from the positive side, you're going to negative infinity. But that's what we determined when we looked at 1 half. This was going to be negative over negative is positive. Yep, going positive. And we use 2 here. We found out that it was uh, negative in the numerator, positive in the denominator, so it was negative here. So, yeah, we have to be going negative there, positive there. Okay. Done. Okay. And what they want you to write here is positive infinity there, negative infinity there. Though I don't like, that's not a limit. 
it says limit does not exist. Okay. Any questions on that? Wonderful day so far, isn't it? Okay, let's go to... Properties of infinite limits. How much time do we have now? 11.40. Three minutes? Okay. Let's go through these quickly. I think we can do them in three minutes. Yeah. Okay. If C and L are any real numbers, well, not any real numbers, they're real numbers, and F and G are functions such that the limit as x approaches C of F of x is a positive infinity, and the limit as x approaches C of G of x is this number of L. If C is a real number, L is a real number, but the limit of L, x is positive infinity, which is a means it doesn't have a limit, but it gets quite large. This does have a limit. Okay. And that's L. So the sum or the difference, the limit as X approaches C of the sum or the difference of, okay, any two functions, if F is, doesn't have a limit and G does, then the sum or the difference don't have a limit. And they're going to the same discontinuity as the as the one did. Now if it was G had a limit of positive infinity, then this would be going to negative infinity of the subtraction G. G did the subtraction. Adding it would be positive. Okay. So the product. The product as X approaches C of an infinite and a fixed value is called B infinite. Okay. Uh, if L is positive. Now if L was negative, that then flips it because then you're multiplying a positive number by a negative number that makes it negative. So if L was less than zero, it goes that way. The quotient. The quotient of the limit as X approaches C of G of X divided by F of X. So G of X is a fixed number, okay, finite number. F is infinitely large, then this is going to zero. Okay, because any time you divide a finite number by an infinitely large number, you're going to zero. And zero is neither positive or negative. Similar properties hold for one-sided limits and for functions for which the limit of f of x is x approaches c is negative infinity, then you have to, you know, just flip a, flip a couple of the signs around that, that it still works. Now, what they didn't do was let this be an L and that be a, an infinity, then the minus sign would be different here. Uh, but they didn't mess with that. <laughs> Frankly, if you've got something without a limit and you're fiddling with it, uh, unless you put that in the denominator, you're going to get something without a limit. Okay, so uh, putting in the denominator then We'll drop that to zero. We're out of time? Okay. We'll begin next time with example five. Okay. Homework exercises here. Whoa! We came that close to finishing. Okay. I wish I had the test ready for you. In either three or five, they're both at count chat, three's at count view. 7 or 9, both at count chat. 7 is at count view. Any of the odds 11 through 15, all at count chat. Uh, 17 to 31, all at count chat. 21 is at count view. 35, 33 or 35, both at count chat. 33 is at count view. 37 to 51, all at count chat. 41 is at count view. Uh, 53 should be at count chat. 55 is a count chat and count view. You can explore doing 57 or 59. They both are a count chat, should be. If they're not, don't mess with them. Uh, 61 should be a count chat. Let's see. Wait a minute. Let's stop at 53. We'll pick up the rest of those next time. Okay. And that does finish the chapter. I'll try to have the test ready for you next time. Um,
And I'll tell you next time some review exercises you might want to look at to help too. We'll begin next time with chapter 3 after we finish that one more example in 2.5. Differentiation chapter is a long one. So this was sort of short, so get a test fairly soon here. Going to be a while on chapter 3. So we'll go as far and fast as we can. Any questions? All right, let me end this.